Bonsoir à tous. Et bienvenue pour ce... Hello everyone and welcome to this monthly webinar organized by Anema. Welcome to everyone. My name is Emmanuel Notari, General Delegate of Anema, and uh, I am here with Tarak Sharif, the President of Anima, who is equally President of uh, National Confederation, uh, uh, Tunisian Confederation of uh, Businesses. We are here to speak about uh, equal opportunities between men and women. And we are here with the, the president of a really important uh, uh, federation. Thanks a lot for being with us. So the, folk, the aim of this webinar is to give you some uh, insights and to share with you some good practice practices about uh, uh, topics that are relevant for the members of the network because all the topics that we uh, that we discuss in these webinars are decided are selected by uh, the committee of members so we decided to organize uh, this webinar and uh, uh, in spite of covid because we wanted to organize it in spite of uh, covid Today, we're going to speak a quite a broad topic that is really relevant today. We are very lucky because today we have a panel of experts with Sukaima Barawi, Executive Director of Kauta. They she with the organization they she works a lot in this topic in Tunisia. Then we have Nade, Nadia Sabanet from the Innovation Catalyst and Agent of Change from Palestine. And we also have Sana Afwaiz, who is the founder and the director of Womenpreneur, an NGO that works a lot for the empowerment of women entrepreneurs. This webinar will be not the end of the discussion because if you want to work with one of the speakers who is going to speak during this webinar, you will be able to get in touch with them. By the way, I would like to thank Business Mad, Business Med, who is supporting us in the organization of this webinar. So you can get in touch with them if you want to cooperate with one of the organizations that are going to that are going to speak during this uh, uh, webinar. So if you want to work uh, with one of the speakers, you can uh, just ask because perhaps there will be conditions uh, to work together with them uh, with the support of the project. And uh, Manon is going to share with you in the chat uh, the, the contact, our contact if you're interested. We have already organized quite a lot of webinars in our website in good practices section. Okay, having said that, we can kick off. We can start with a discussion about promoting gender equality with investors and enterprises. Actually, uh, gender equality is one of the objectives of the Millennium, uh, uh, Millennium Goals, Development Goals because uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, milestone, this objective is really much related to all the others. Representing Anima, I can tell you that uh, we carry out lots of programs to support uh, businesses, and uh, uh, we have lots and lots of applications uh, from women. Our uh, aim is 30% quota for women. We we don't really reach it all the time. I am now in Marseille and figures, uh, speaking about figures in, in France, there is a status called auto-entrepreneur, so self-employed status. 40% of these self-employed uh, business, self-employed uh, uh, businesses uh, are made of uh, uh, women. But speaking about uh, projects that continue with incubation and so on and so forth, uh, well, just 10% is made of women. So there is a sort of a, a green ceiling. There is a ceiling uh, that, uh, sorry, a glass ceiling uh, hindering 
women from having access to business world. So this is a really important topic to discuss with our three speakers. But before giving the floor to the first speaker, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Tarak Sharif, who is the president of Anima. Hello. I am very happy and I'm really honored to be with you today. For the first time, even more, because it is the first time as a president of Anima, and I'm here in Marseille, so I will um, be really happy to be here. And uh, we are going to speak about gender equality with women representing different organizations. I am here in the offices, uh, in the headquarters of Anima, and uh, we have lots and lots of women working with us. In 2006, there were some women working in Anima. And we really have to thank them. I would like to mention them because uh, it is the minimum, the bare minimum that we can do to thank them. Leila Spiti for Morocco, Mufesopo for Egypt, Fatma Olani for Tunisia, El Roy for Israel, Safia Quera for Algeria. These are women who have been really uh, founders, who have played a really important role in founding Anima. So at least the minimum that we can do is to thank them and mention them, to really thank them for the important role that they played. Anima today has uh, six, 70 members from more than 20, uh, 20 countries uh, with 15 uh, staff managing about 40 million. And uh, it's uh, quite a, a lot of work carried out in lots of countries uh, and Anima provides lots of services uh, to different uh, organizations working in this network. And uh, ever since uh, this morning, when I came here, I really realized uh, that there are lots and lots of women in the headquarters of Anima. And uh, this is an opportunity for me to thank them. Clementine, Lo, Zoe, Ima, Sekedaria, Oxan, Manon, Raphael, Sarah, then three men, Aurélien, Mathias, Emmanuel, so as you can see, as much uh, as Anima is concerned, women play a really crucial role. So they provide uh, a really important service to Anima. The willingness to have a better balance between women and women is something that you can't uh, do overnight. It is a daily job something that you need to do at every at each level every day everywhere you need to make sure that uh, you can balance uh, uh, that you can have a good balance between uh, men and uh, women and this is also my personal experience in the field of my activity in tunisia and everywhere normally women uh, play a really crucial role in generating a f good idea. So we need to make sure that women are more and more represented, represented uh, in all organizations. For example, last week I signed with Femme Dynamique with Madame Mrs. Valérie Dunom in Tunisia from uh, Cameroon. Uh, an agreement with Connect that I chair and the aim of this agreement is uh, to make sure that uh, there are more and more exchanges between uh, Connect and their organization to organize different activities. Uh, can I, I chair Connect? And uh, Connect, in Connect, we just have uh, uh, women. And uh, I can only, I could never support more 
or enough the importance of having women in all organizations because women play a crucial role they can only lead to good results so I do not want to take too much time because we have really illustrious speakers, Madame Sokaina, that I know in person. So I can, uh, I'm really happy to have her, Mrs. Nadia and Mrs. Sana. So thanks a lot for your presence, for being with us. And I wish you a fantastic webinar. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thanks a lot, uh, Tarak Sharif. And without any further ado, we are going to uh, give the floor to Madame Sona Alo Bolawi, Sukaina Burawi. Mrs. Sukaina, can you please uh, give us a, a, a snapshot of the situation in our countries in the MENA region? So, what is the role played by women in these uh, regions? Mrs. Sukaina, Sukaima, the floor to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I had some problems with the mic, so I just wanted to make sure that you can hear me. I would like to congratulate uh, uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Sharif for being the president of uh, Anima. That is one of our partners, a really faithful partner, especially in the field of Epsomet. So I would like to thank all the organizers, first of all, for organizing a specific webinar on this topic because uh, uh, gender equality is a really important topic. Uh, my presentation is going to be divided into two parts. First of all, we are going to speak about uh, the, uh, the gender gap or the, the, we are going to give you a snapshot uh, to show you that women are not enough. And the second part of uh, my presentation will be devoted to give you, to give you some uh, suggestions, so to give some recommendations. But my speech is going to be really short. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail because since 2003, together with the World Bank, we have launched and reported the first uh, uh, document of women in uh, in uh, uh, Arab countries together with the Queen Rania from Jordan. And recently we have even launched uh, together with the OCDE a report uh, with uh, all the figures, uh, all data, so you can find all information there. So I can't really teach you anything. I can just tell you that entrepreneurship in Arab countries, especially in Maghreb, and especially, particularly in Tunisia, unfortunately, so entrepreneurship for women is quite weak. So entrepreneurship in general is quite uh, poor and weak, but when it comes to women, in uh, specifically well it is even it is even worse so we do not even have the critical mass so it is more or less uh, the same figure that was mentioned about Marseille in incubators so less than 10 percent when i speak about less than 10 percent of women in um, women entrepreneurs uh, well when I, as I said, I don't want to show you tables or give you too many uh, figures, but in an, what I want to do is not to speak about uh, harassment that is suffered by women uh, in, uh, um, in companies. And I'm not going to speak about violence and harassing, hindering women from becoming managers. I'm not just speaking about women uh, who are uh, in advanced position or leaders in companies, but also polit politicians, women politicians. Uh, there are lots and lots of taboos about uh, this topic, but we even uh, carried out some uh, qualitative studies about uh, uh, women. Uh, by the way, if you want to have more information about that, just let me know. But uh, 
In my speech, I would like to draw on the experience, fantastic experience of Anima, by the way. I would like to congratulate you for organizing this, organizing this webinar. And I would like to seize the opportunity to speak about our obligations as associations and organizations. We need to work to reach the 17 aims of the Millennium goals, especially number five, goal number five, according to which all countries, including private sector, women need to play a more important role. This is really important to me. Gender mainstream, that is the goal. Because uh, this goal is very much intertwined with the other seven, 16 uh, goals. Uh, that is why I would like to uh, congratulate Anima for the fantastic job that they do. So I have started uh, uh, having a look at the webinars and the work that is, has been done by Anima, a fantastic job. There were webinars about COVID and the impact also on a financial situation. COVID really create, had many, many drawbacks in all fields. And I've learned a lot from this webinar, but I've also, I've also heard to many, many speeches, not all of them, but lots and lots of them because I followed these webinars that were organized in the past, and I realized that uh, the gender uh, aspect has not been very much discussed. But you know, during this uh, webinar to dedicated to gender I realized that, uh, well, we are going to speak about women in this webinar, but not in, in the other webinars. So they were not really, there was not uh, a lot of discussion in the other webinars about problems related uh, to women. All of those who, like me, work a lot on gender uh, topics, gender related topics, well, we wouldn't be really useful if we didn't really speak and re remind the huge gaps of women. Sometimes we speak about this gap uh, because there is a huge gap. And so we need to ask the question all the time, saying that there are 80% of uh, uh, women in a, in a company is not enough because this is not what uh, the element that creates a leverage effect because, because we need to work on culture. Because having women in a company at top level is really healthy for a business. I have to underline that the fact that diversity and gender was neglected was not uh, was linked to the fact that women who participated to this webinar didn't really talk a lot. There were 10 women out of 35 speakers that they did their presentations, but they didn't really they didn't really illustrated enough the impact of the pandemic of pandemic on them there were not so many actions so many measures being implemented by uh, by governments to support women after covid So no specific uh, discussion was uh, done uh, for uh, women. But in spite of that, uh, for companies, uh, lots of studies uh, 
dozens of studies, including one in America lasting four years by Catalyst organization, studied 350 shops out of 500 of Fortune a company, showed that there is a strong correlation between gender gender equality in a company and profitability. So when women play an important role, when there is a critical mass of women, well, profitability is better. And so women having more women at top level have a better financial performance. And this is true in different uh, in different sectors. So profitability is more than 37%. And uh, so I think that the, this figure say a lot and much more than the tables that I could have shared uh, with you and that you can find in all reports issued by the OECD or the World Bank. During these, the two webinars, there was a lot of saying about economic, but not specifically about women. And uh, when they speak about women, they do not really speak about uh, uh, gender gap. And that is true on data dying, done on micro or macro level. Um, as the manager of the private sector, uh, you comprehend it, do not really understand what I could have presented as a recommendation. I protected myself in order to present some guidelines, some, um, some things that I think that uh, great financial institutions have proposed in their strategy after the sanitary crisis, for instance the health crisis sorry uh, there are some guidelines allowing you to subscribe to this uh, path and these are uh, guidelines for uh, for the creation of a guideline of uh, programs in companies big or small and on the other hand highlighting the work of women elaborate data uh, even even through your work organization, and uh, to show how many decisions were, speak, were were picked by women, uh, the reports can be tackled and and everything like that. This is really important, and it's um, and uh, being that uh, being that uh, parliamentary women being that women in companies, it's never considered as important. And for companies, it's the same thing. We are not the ones, uh, the only ones in cause here. Uh, the fur orientation that I summarize uh, this uh, way, in a general way, but uh, then I'll give you some example. And uh, the other great guideline is to facilitate the access, an equal access to women and men to services, um, not, I'm talking about bank and financial services, for instance. You know that uh, women do not have the same access as youngsters have, and especially in our country and in the Mediterranean region, do not have the same access to bank services that uh, men do. At the same level, there is an insufficient access to all other services, um, being that financial bank or health services are men first. The rights of men is the access to services, access to bank, bank and financial training. Uh, as of today, we do not have any other guideline for the development as an essential lever to entrepreneurship. The entrepreneurship training and financial training must be 
uh, must go together with the with the rights of men. Let's not stay in theory there. Let's uh, uh, let's really teach youngsters and particularly to women, despite their age, how to be an entrepreneur and how to be able to tackle risks, to take risks and to advance. That's what I want to say when I say access to services, but even to access to uh, advice and information, you know, in incubators, when there is good advertisement, we go there. When there are trainings at 6 p.m., women cannot um, cannot follow them, cannot take part in them, and so they do not know what, they, what kind of options they might have. So, seeing that the pandemic has ruptured all our system, world, global, economical, but especially emerging country, financial institutions got together to try and find solution and give guidelines, as I said, and particularly, I will uh, pick some example, for instance, uh, the uh, the uh, the challenge uh, gender times collaborative. Uh, this is done by experts in terms of investment that have a, a point of view that goes towards a greater participation of women, and they've shown through real indicator not only that the pandemic strikes harder women but the working group has also implemented an initiative to take up the gender issue by the investors and by the financial sector in order to do that a tender has been launched to respond to the crisis and to be able to invest in a in solutions so how to do that for instance what i was saying before uh, looking at uh, portfolio, I highlight in exemplary practices, launch long-term um, roadmaps and programs for inclusivity and for women participation, collaborate to the creation to financial mechanism to join, um, help to help those entrepreneurs who have equality in their mind and all the financial stakeholders that respond to the needs of women first. The working group of the gender fine, collaborative gender fines will uh, participate in the is is taking part to the assessment and dissemination of these opportunities. In the same way, the World Bank for their 2025 strategy, they have reoriented even more in a gender neutral policy. Uh, I would like to give you the example of the BAD who launched a call for action, which is really interesting. Uh, since 2016, they launched a, a call that I call the APA, if I remember correctly. Schwa? The African Bank since 2016, an affirmative action for women in Africa to to fill the gap to access to funding and this amounts to 40 billion dollars and the new strategy of bad is really interesting they want to make available up until up to five billion dollars in financing for in women's initiative the bank has engaged in supporting the financial institution that um that operates on the African continent. I know that our president, uh, Animus president, is really open to these questions. To all the companies operating on the African continent uh, in order to help small and medium enterprises managed, managed by women, in order to help them adapt their product and services of course, the great financial institution, the World Bank, the FMI, have also uh, uh, at heart the entre entrepreneurship, not only as a motor, but also to insist on the lever that on the leverage that trained women and good entrepreneurs as they can be can have.
in profitability. So to encourage them to be entrepreneur and to keep being entrepreneur, that's, that's the aim, not only to open one's company, but to sustain yourself and to sustain your company. So I hope, I really hope that I really, because I really like Anima and I think it's uh, an incredible association that I discovered through Absomed. I, I hope that Anima in the framework of Absomed and beyond will be able to carry out a monitoring and assessment on all the initiatives and all the resolution going towards women access. Because you know that resolutions are all well and good, but they need to be supervised because otherwise they are not always implemented. So I think it would be really interesting if we would create a sort of follow-up and monitoring with Emmanuel and Mr. Tarek Sharif of these resolutions in Africa and beyond it to see if the financial institution that are uh, sustaining the shock of the pandemic when they'll discover they will be less rich because of that they will not turn to women for their recommendation and initiatives and we are here also to try to give a warning uh to be a little bit the police but uh um because we are absolutely certain that you are with us in the conviction and we would like you to be more with us in the, into action thank you very much madam for this vibrant speech that of course speaks to us and uh, it is important uh, to put forward all the points that you've talked about thank you very much uh, about taking having taken part to the last webinars and so on and so forth thank you thank you i will not go back i will not give a reply i i think that what you said is quite clear it uh, the gender issue must be transversal and must be tackled throughout all sectors and topics uh, despite uh, all this we 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 see <laughs> sorry about that we see two different point of views um certain people think as you do that the gender issue must be promoted must be highlighted systematically throughout the board and others some who have ambition in the companies or have a governance status they do not want to be discriminated because of their gender they want to have equality throughout the company uh, since you are in Tunisia, do you do you participate in this debate, or do you think it's not the case? I think that the financial institutions that govern the world know what they are doing. So all the entrepreneurs in the world are looking of on uh, are looking to what the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank do. So it is. If they're, if they're not leading the way, what could I tell you? I, 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 I am just an observer. And when I've seen yesterday what happened to, in the Tunisian parliament, the pity, the pity of a man deputy that struck a woman only because he's a man and he dares to hit women, I say that that is unacceptable and any women wherever they are must feel insulted by a man representing men and hitting and striking a woman and as long as that happens as long as he dares to strike a woman because she is a woman because it would have would it would it have been a man he wouldn't have done it. But as long as this can continue, all women throughout the world must feel insulted and must uh, fear that they could be struck or hit one day just because they are women. And I think that we, we, we need more solidarity and uh, throughout uh, the the women gender and the men the humans must work and support fragile women and they have to boost women that managed to be entrepreneur that had success in life because uh, uh, they've done 
a lot of efforts. Ask them questions as you would in an anthropologic study and you'll see the level of suffering that they went through to go to get up there. Eighty percent of that is blah, six, seventy percent, ten percent, whatever. In any case, men to get to the top, they suffer. Nobody gets there because is is more good looking than others, or or more fun than others. I'm just telling you that men and women do suffer to get to the top. A woman can be killed just because she's a woman. A a uh, woman is raped uh, most uh, more often than a man if if a, if a man takes women from the streets and rapes them uh, they're, 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 we, we need to be with this uh, woman and not to say that there is no problem is normal is natural and i'm aligned with you and the international monetary institution and with your work Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, speech and uh, for what you are saying as well. Uh, for your proposal, we are we will be really happy to collaborate with you. Um, it is your job to understand this topic, so we want to continue to collaborate and to work with you. Of course, if we can build some initiative together, we will be more than willing to do so. Um, on questions about entrepreneurship and for leadership uh, and also you talk about an acceptable situation and violent situation that need to be uh, known throughout the board i have a meeting i'd like to have a meeting with Tarek sheriff and i'd like him to come to see us in our country with uh, the utmost pleasure Madame Burawi, you know all the respect and the friendship that I have towards you. I will, I will take, uh, I, I, will, I will exploit the occasion to, to talk about women and uh, about entrepreneurship and so on and so forth. You, you might, you, you might off, Madam. Uh, are there any other questions or request to intervene or some uh, reactions to the intervention done by Miss uh, Burawi? No. In this case, once again, thank you very much. You talked about access to services, and this is the exactly the topic of one of our next uh, panel, panelists. I know them and I admire them. They will not say everything, but for Palestine, I can tell you that our heart is crying because we cannot send them uh, funds whilst we collaborate in uh, in in uh, european project because there's an embargo right now and so they are blocking the funds and this is i think another warning that we should give to help our friends our palestinian friends in in france it works anyway but uh, we will move to our first intervention from palestine nadia sabane catalyst of intervention hello nadia Hello, Are thanks you there? for having me. Yes, sure. Thanks for being with us. Uh, right. So we will, we will uh, show you a video uh, with your speech and uh, and then we have an exchange and questions with you. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you for being with us, Nadia. 0% is not a promotional interest rate. It's the percentage of Palestinian startups that secured investment from the first VC in Palestine and were founded or co-founded by women. Quite alarming, not that much, because this is the case when it comes to uh, anything related with women. So in Palestine, we are half of the population, yet our contribution in the workforce is around 19%. The unemployment rate amongst female youth um, aged between 15 and 29 is around 66%, while the unemployment amongst women who have 13 years of education and higher, like higher education, um, the unemployment rate amongst them is around 54%. The percentage of women in advanced positions is around 10%. And the pay gap between women and men, of course, we are lagging behind by 30%. 
We are really educated. We are really competitive. Uh, the literacy rate amongst women in Palestine is around 96%. If you have a look in the Palestinian universities, you will find the majority of students are of women and the majority of the top students, um, especially in scientific streams are of women. So these are women who come up with innovative solutions as their graduation projects. But if you ask them, would you take a step further and create a business around this innovative solution, more than 80% of those will doubt their ability to start and manage a business. And you will find actually that 84% uh, of those will say that the community and culture is an obstacle for us to, to have startups. And 10% would say it's technology and skills. While 55% will say that the obstacle for us to be entrepreneurs and to have our startups is the access to finance and to investment opportunities. While 82% say it's the supportive infrastructure and services provided for us in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And actually, if you have women who start their businesses, it would be um, in sort of small business, handicrafts, microfinance funded projects. They are fine, but our vision is to have women to have more efficient and disruptive role in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Why? To have more sustainable and impactful economic development in Palestine and in, in the region. Our mission is to unlock the potential of women to play a key role in a more inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem. How? By creating a nexus for us, a one-stop shop for women entrepreneurs, women enablers, women mentors, and women investors. Our work will focus on these pillars. First, we will build our confidence and our capacity. We will build our entrepreneurial mindset our uh, soft skills, our technical skills, our 21st century skills. Then we will provide incubation, incubating programs, acceleration programs for the innovative ideas that women have. We will provide them with programs that will cover the progress of an idea from the idea up to be a, a commercial product in the market. And then we'll provide financial investment for those who decide to create startups. And to be honest, at any stage, if a woman decides to stop, like this is not my thing, she will benefit from those um, provided services into becoming more employable, to have more skills that will even make her more competitive for different roles that she aims to have. We will create a supportive community for ourselves and for women who want to join us uh, by providing mentorship, apprenticeship, internship opportunities where women can lift each other while they are climbing the ladder. And while doing so, we will increase and enhance our visibility. Why not? Uh, it's no secret, uh, Palestine is part of the world and everyone is suffering from the uh, effect of the pandemic for the last year. Uh, many business owners had to, uh, uh, to fire uh, employees and uh, many children uh, were staying at home and women found themselves that, that uh, they had to uh, leave their work or uh, they were like uh, sacrificed uh, with uh, first, and uh, they were uh, jobless. They did not have a regular job, uh, not anymore. Um, and this is why this is the right time to have uh, a push to, uh, to accelerate the momentum of women entrepreneurship in Palestine and in the region. What's needed to be successful and why I am here one is to introduce myself and the uh, initiative for every one of you and to build bridges to um, counterpart ecosystems to uh, uh, to win 
uh, uh, potential partners, allies, and community members, mentors, investors to our network who have of, of like-minded people who believe in the same mission that we are on and would like for us to support each other to realize our uh, vision that we uh, started this presentation with to have more impactful and sustainable contribution of women in, in the economic development. This is my LinkedIn and this is my email. I hope that uh, I'll hear from you and uh, we will explore ideas how we can make this work in Palestine and scaling it up to the region and to the Mediterranean basin. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia, for this, uh, this presentation. Uh, could you could you tell us when when this uh, started this uh, this uh, guichet of uh, of uh, of service? When when did you launch that? Okay. So and a bit, a bit of the of the of the figures of the number of, of uh, women that you did uh, serve with this with the services so far. Sure. So this is very new initiative. Uh, well, uh, I am passionate about women empowerment and tech women being a fellow of different programs that empower women in, in STEM fields. So I thought of after 13 years of working for all of the uh, sectors uh, in, in innovation centric positions, it's about time to uh, utilize my passion and my experience uh, and my education all together in, a, in an initiative that will provide the system change. So this is very new initiative that uh, was built on a survey that more than 200 women uh, took and uh, they decided actually the pillars. So we designed the work together. Uh, what are the pillars for us to focus on? what's needed for them, what's, uh, what is the priority of these needed services. And hence, we designed the program. Uh, we are in the very first steps. Uh, we just registered the organization locally, and uh, we are about to launch a pilot project that will be our MVP uh, uh, to a larger community worldwide. Okay, great. Uh, and, and good luck for, for the launch. Then. I remind the participants that you can put your questions in the chat box or raise your hands if you want to. Uh, if you want to, uh, to uh, question uh, uh, Nadia, uh, Nadia, uh, from your experience of the working in innovation and entrepreneurship in the past, what what makes it specific to design a, a, a guichet, a program for women entrepreneurs? What, what do you? What is a special care that you that you put in the in the, in the program that concerns specifically women? Or is, is, if there is any. Or, so, or yeah, uh, totally. So the thing is that there are many initiatives that like this is not uh, a, a, a brand new thing. Uh, every one of us know that uh, women entrepreneurs should be utilized and should be uh, activated towards uh, a gender dividend or towards uh, a, a, a realizing in economic development because you have half of the population that are, that's not uh, 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 utilized towards uh, an increase in, in progress in the GDP, let's say. Um, so there are initiatives that tackled and have been tackling women entrepreneurship, but it's very, uh, uh, let's say, scattered. It's not uh, structured uh, and it tackles different components. And it starts, actually, it starts by myself, by every woman who uh, doubts her ability to start a business and manage it. So we are good in science. We get high grades, yet we don't take a step. Uh, uh, forward in starting a business. So we want to work on a system change on the whole spectrum, providing the whole chain of services, starting from building the woman's uh, confidence to start her business or, or to compete or to, um, to know and to, to believe that this is her right. And uh, it's not like uh, a gift from anyone. It's her right to be a uh, uh, to compete and to get access to different opportunities and to different resources. So starting from that uh, uh, 
sort of building the mindset and the confidence up to uh, the ideation and to incubating innovative ideas, investing in those startups, um, building a network for uh, uh, women investors and providing them with the mentorship, um, a woman to woman mentorship that's very important to, to provide them with a supportive community that will show them the way ahead of them and pave the way ahead of them. Uh, so what, what's really very special about this initiative that it's, it tackles a system change, it tackles the whole journey, the entrepreneurial journey um uh, from it's not only from idea to market it goes beyond this into what is before the idea the confidence and the mindset and what's after the market with the uh the global visibility and support the community and uh, um, uh, more access to uh available funds no, that's that's uh, that's very clear the, the, the glass ceiling that you you mentioned during the presentation, which is a community and culture. Uh, this to break it, it's about uh, working on, on the psychology and uh, raising, lifting the doubts, raising the confidence, and uh, so it's it's a bit before before the entrepreneurship journey that there uh, is a specific work to do with women, and and otherwise it seems that uh, the entrepreneurship program is is a, is a rather standard one uh, that for 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 any entrepreneurs, women or, or men. When, when, once the once the, the ID is there, once the the, the, the business uh, opportunity is identified, then it's a, it's a classic. Uh, it's obviously a classic uh, uh, program, I suppose. Um, do participants have question or want to to intervene to speak? To what's the question to Nadia? What what would be for you the the challenge for the, the, the success of, of this uh, this initiative, uh, uh, Nadia, what, what, what is your, your need currently or your challenge? Uh, it's the uh, first is the access to the uh, pool of talent, let's say. So there are uh, women in different communities in, within Palestine. So there are women in, in West Bank, in Jerusalem, in Gaza. And every uh, a group of those is facing a different set of challenges so the access to those women and to win them as uh, um, uh, uh, as the beneficiaries of the program and then uh, uh, you have also uh, a, a, the the community of uh, this initiative from mentors to partners uh, uh, we will not reinvent the wheel. So when it comes to an incub classic incubation program, it will be in partnership with existing entities. So it's very important for us to, uh, to have partners. And of course, uh, a, a, the, a, the support when it comes to investment. Uh, uh, one thing that is new to Palestine and it's, uh, it's suggested in this initiative is the uh, angel investment network of women. So we don't have a structured angel investment. So we would like within this initiative to educate and to build a club for angel investors who are women or supporters of women that will give a priority to invest in women-led uh, startups. Uh, Anima, we, we have been creating the, the first business angel networks in, uh, in Morocco, in Tunisia, and in Jordan. So if you need uh, our or support uh, that we will be uh, uh, welcome to that. So when you say access to talent, it means access to expertise or access to women who wants to be entrepreneur? Uh, uh, actually, I meant that as the women who want to be entrepreneurs because I come from a village in the north of West Bank and uh, the culture there is very different from the city. Women are expected at certain age to get married and to not go to university. And if they go to university, then uh, they go to uh, very light, let's say, not male dominated fields, not engineering and not medicine. Uh, and I was always on the front lines in male dominated majors. And that was uh, a first. So you want to, to have more of us and uh, 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 more, uh, more women who want to, to have this journey. 
so the access of the talent itself, but always we want to enrich our pool of expertise, of course, and here I'm, through you, I'm reaching out to, uh, to partners, to people who have tried this approach in their, uh, in their countries and would like to share the, uh, the, the lessons that they learned uh, throughout their experience. Thank you, Nadia. I think Sukaina, you wanted to, to, you want to intervene, Madame Sukaina? Sukaina wanted to say something about this because I could read in the chat that there is a question. How many women leaders, entrepreneurs uh, work with women? Can you please clarify this question, Sukaina, because it is, it is not really clear. Yes, I wanted to know how many Nadias do we have in Palestine? How many women work really in the field of gender equality? Because uh, as Emmanuel said, uh, very often there are two versions. So there, uh, there are women who do not want to be discriminated against and uh, they do not want to show their agenda not to be discriminated. So I just wanted to know how many people, how many um, women are models in this way? So I'm speaking about women entrepreneurs in a, in a, in a no mixed uh, company. So how far, what is uh, the extension of the gender genderization? because the number of women entrepreneurs is much uh, lower than that of, of men. And so in proportion, is it half of women who work, who would work with us uh, uh, to carry out an action for, to support women entrepreneurs, uh, such as Sana, Nadia? So I, I just wanted to, I just would like to have a sort of barometer to know how many women work uh, to support this project. The question, huh? yes. yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question and for your speech earlier. Uh, so we are very few uh, in general in the ecosystem in Palestine. We are very few, less than 10. And if you want an idea about this, let's say, uh, and, and I'm really glad that Dr. Safa Nasir Dean, who is the former uh, minister of uh, uh, telecommunication and IT in Palestine is, is attending here with us. And she is on the board of the Presidential Higher Council for Innovation and Excellence, who is uh, a, a country partner with you, uh, Anima. And on the board, there are very few uh, women compa compared to tens of men. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we are very few uh, on, on different roles. So you, you will find one COO of a VC. And that's it. When it comes to VC investment, we have only one female involved in the in the world of uh, VCs. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, incubators, there is also uh, one C, uh, one CEO who is female, and uh, and there is a social entrepreneurship uh, incubator also led by a woman. And um, and that's it. Like we are less than ten. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So the number is uh, as as the enablers in the ecosystem in general. We are very few, and for uh, those who believe in a women-only initiative, uh, let's say there is only one entity in Palestine. It's not only about entrepreneurship. It's a, a business forum for women. Um, and uh, and I would like to clarify that the initiative is not about. Uh, a, let's say isolating women entrepreneurs it's just to uh, level their skills level them up and scale them up uh, to uh, to a point where they can compete it's we are not isolating them uh, many men mentors and uh, investors are welcome to uh, who are supporter of women are welcome to share their expertise with us but we are giving a, an advantage for women to benefit from those services as a start. When, when the numbers and the statistics are great for our performance, then maybe it will be open to other uh, marginalized groups within the community, like uh, uh, youth from refugee camps, uh, youth from Gaza, uh, because we are facing different sorts of uh, issues, social issues within the community. So 
Okay, last question, Nadia. Is there a specific business opportunity? Is there are there specific business opportunities that you think uh, are, are interesting for women in Palestine uh, as as entrepreneurs? It's a question from uh, Sukaina as well. Uh, yes, I think um, agritech, edtech, uh, many untapped fields. Uh, women can, like, there is a business opportunity for women in all of the fields. Uh, they have the uh, education, the knowledge, and yet they lack, they only lack the tools that we are to provide them with. And uh, they can, uh, if they don't want to start their businesses with the uh, education and the training they get, they can be more employable. And there is the freelancing, there is the outsourcing services. So you, you uh, build their capacity and they become more employable and they get jobs remotely or through an outsourcing company, a Palestinian outsourcing company with a multinational tech company like Google, Microsoft, Apple, and others. So there is a business opportunity uh, yeah, and we want to uh, connect them to those. Okay. Once again, thank you very much, Nadia Samani. Good luck for this new, uh, this new initiative. Uh, we keep in touch, obviously, if, uh, if we can help, uh, if we can collaborate in uh, developing business angels in Palestine, we'll be very happy to, to, to do so. Uh, but thank you once again for, for being with us and taking the time of sharing your, 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 your story in, uh, during this webinar. Thank uh, you. Goodbye. Uh, Sana Afwez is with us. Hello, Sana. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you. Yourself? Thank you. Good to have you. So thank this you. time we, you, you were kind enough to record a video in advance. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so It was a quick video. <laughs> no, yeah, I was a, traveling to Spain, so six, six minutes video, but it's good. So we show we show this video, and then we we come back to you with some questions. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sana Afwais. I am the founder and director of Womenpreneur Organization, a non-profit institution that is supporting and empowering women across 23 countries. Since 2016, we have empowered, reached, and supported 15,000 women across the Middle East and North Africa region. Our aim and our objective is always to be the voice of women, to make sure that women are in the heart of the ecosystem of the future. Since 2016, we have worked to highlight the challenges facing women and put in place actions to limit them and make sure that every woman is an active actor in the economic development of this region. Today, I would like to share with you our testimony and also our insight about the real challenges facing women when it comes to accessing venture capital and finance. As you all know, any country's development, economic and social progress is actually related to the gender equality in that country. The MENA region has the largest gender gap globally when it comes to establishing businesses and startups. A percentage of 40%. Because of this, the region is losing about 575 billion a year. You would ask me why? What is the reason behind this uh, lack of support to women? What are the real challenges facing these women to access financing and establish businesses? Well, there are different reasons. 10 minutes would not be enough to actually go through them all. But let me kind of highlight the most important one. First one, low availability of guarantee assets. This is basically the main cause or one of the main causes that hinder women's access to financing because of traditional property arrangements in the region. And these obstacles are still relevant to this day. So when you look at the inheritance laws in the MENA region, that actually favors male over females. So this ultimately makes women less uh, capable to get funding, to get investments, uh, to get credits, to get loans um, from banks and financial institutions. So then they have to go to what we call the three Fs, 
family, friends, and fools. That means that these women entrepreneurs will depend on um, very informal sources of financing that are very limited, and that will actually push them to be solo entrepreneurs and only create businesses for them to survive. Second reason, gender biases among the financial institutions. We have done at Womenpreneur different workshops for investors where we basically show them uh, uh, inspiring uh, young um, uh, entrepreneurs, whether male or female, who would pitch in front of a jury. And then the jury would pick in general, 80% they would pick the man. After that, we would give them uh, the business uh, pitch. So basically just the business plan for them to read without knowing the gender and the person behind that business. And surprisingly, about 70% of the investors, they would choose the female business plans. So this probably shows how important it is for financial institutions to realize that gender biases do impact on the decision they make, do impact on the type of entrepreneurs they choose, and do impact especially on the opportunities for women. The third reason, or the third um, challenge for women is basically lack of financial education, lack of uh, financial literacy among female entrepreneurs. During COVID, we noticed that a lot of female entrepreneurs, um, they would go and they will ask for credits uh, for microfinance. And for those who succeeded to get those credits, they would actually use that money for family reasons, for family business, instead of their startup for their enterprises and that's because we still lack financial literacy um, th this needs um, a serious dedication to actually educate um, the, uh, the female entrepreneurs on how to manage their, their money how to make smart financial decisions and especially how to make sure that they differentiate between the personal and the business side Last reason, um, and because as I mentioned, it's only 10 minutes, so I want to be and respect the, 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 the kind of, you know, the limits of this video. Um, the last reason or the last challenge, I would say the lack of alternative services and products. Banks and financial institutions, they need to innovate. They need to uh, rethink their system. They need to uh, make sure that they put in place products that are inclusive, uh, that are accessible to everyone. Because when we look today at the challenges that COVID has brought, and when we look at the number of female entrepreneurs that have lost their jobs, and now they're turning into entrepreneurship as a way for them to survive, I think financial institutions need to rethink their system, need to rethink their products. Because women, as approved through different studies and through different reports, they are a very um, loyal uh, clients, they pay their credits, they pay the loans. So this means that the banks need to make sure they put in place products and services that would respond to these female entrepreneurs. We are talking about more than 50% of the population of the region. Private, public, a civil society and all support organizations need to work together to make sure that every woman in the region has access to equal rights and has access to equal opportunities to finance. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Sana. Uh, when I heard this speech, you, you speak of about exclusively about access to finance. Huh? Uh, yes. That's the main, uh, the main blockage uh, uh, is- uh, One of the main. <laughs> The guarantee, the financial education, the, the existing of alternative solution for finance. The bias, very interesting, the, the, the bias discrimination from, from investors that you, that you are mentioning. Uh, you said that 10 minutes would not be enough. Do you have other, uh, other uh, uh, I'd say, uh, constraints to mention uh, about uh, this situation where, where we have this 40% gap between men and women entrepreneurs in the MENA region? 
Well, I thought I had more to say until the intervention of Madame Zukaina, <laughs> who I admire and uh, I would like to thank her on behalf of all women for always being the voices and representing the voices of women all over the region. Um, I mean, if we look at the region um, and the, the, the women empowerment aspect of it, it's not new. We've been talking about women empowerment in the region since a long time ago. And still the numbers are, are, are really shocking. If we look, I mean, the region has the lowest female ownership uh, in business in the world. We have the lowest women employment in the world. Uh, half of the female population in the MENA region is disconnected from internet. However, we have 75% of women graduating from STEAM. So basically the industries of the future. Um, so this shows that, you know, what, are, what is the future that we are preparing for women in the region? And the region is still in some countries in the region, they are still going under civil, uh, civil wars and conflicts and so on. So I think we are looking at women empowerment in the region in a very superficial way, to be honest. And I think um, I'm going to take the advantage since this discussion is open and honest. Um, yes. I think there is a lot of um, politics involved in, into kind of, you know, whether to support women or not. I think we are forgetting that it's human dignity that we need to recognize. When a country is basically providing opportunity to women, we should not feel like, okay, we are lucky and we should thank the country for doing that. This is a human right that has been deprived from women since years ago. So I think uh, the, or, uh, the, the European and the international community have also a role to play. I mean, today we have Anima, we have Epsobed, uh, there is also Union of the Mediterranean. I think this platform could help us as civil society who are trying to push and support and put pressure on uh, decision makers and local authorities to support women. You also have your role to do as well to, and to, to kind of contribute to that and make sure that every woman in the region has equal access to opportunities and also is has access to the human dignity. I think this is an important thing to actually emphasize on. So I emphasized in my intervention on um, access to finance because I have been asked to talk about that. And also I think it was a hot topic during COVID. At Womenpreneur, um, for us when COVID happened, we felt like, okay, normally what we do, we go on the ground, we implement projects, we are very close to our community. COVID happened, we were like, okay, what can we do? We need to be close to our community. So we decided to launch a platform called Womenpreneur Digital Hub, which today has more than 6,000 women across the MENA region. And basically what we do is we provide uh, educational opportunities, entrepreneurship skills, um, and also access to a community, a safe place where women can speak out, can share their concern, that can share their recommendations as well. And basically every week we have a bunch of trainings and educational programs happening. For us, it's a tool, it's a space where we actually make sure that women are updating their knowledge in the context of COVID, where events are not happening anymore, where women are losing their jobs more and more. I mean, about 1 million of jobs have disappeared since COVID in the MENA region. And about 47% of these jobs are done by women. So for us, women planner, we're trying to put a space where women are updating their knowledge in order to be ready to find a job or to create their own jobs. And at the same time, we have been collecting uh, testimonials from these women to actually understand what can we do to support them? What can we um, kind of do also to advocate for their voices? So we've been uh, working on a policy paper, basically looking at the challenges and the impact of COVID on female-led businesses in three countries, Algeria, Egypt, and Lebanon. And we actually just finalized the paper, so I'll be delighted to share with you our fundings hopefully that you can use that as a way for you also to push for female entrepreneurship in the region post-covid and basically access to finance was one of the main issues uh, because banks and financial institutions did not have alternative services and products to support these women who in general they are solo entrepreneurs they are survival entrepreneurs they have small businesses through which they are surviving. So the bank institutions, they couldn't actually fill in the gap. This is why a lot of women have to, to kind of close and shut down their businesses. And the few of them who received credits and loans, what they have done, they have used 
the, the, the funds to, for personal reasons. And this is where the issue of edu financial education is that female entrepreneurs in the region still don't make this difference between the business, the money of, of your business, the revenues of your business, and then your personal um, uh, kind of money. I mean, you are a founder of that company, but you are still an employee of that uh, company as well. Mm -hmm. So the way you manage your, 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 your money and the way you manage your financial decisions is very important. And I think this is what the female entrepreneurs, in addition to lack of access to alternative services and uh, financial products, there is the issue of actually educating the female entrepreneurs themselves on how to manage their finances and how to make smart financial, financial decisions. And then you have also the complications of the legislation in the region. I mean, as a woman, if you are, let's say, in, in a country in the region, in most of the countries in the region, and you want to ask for a simple credit, I mean, you still have uh, to show a permission from your husband, from your brother, from, I don't know, like your cousin or even your son, I mean, it's 2021 and we are ask, still asking women for permissions. And then you still have to show a guarantee, asset guarantee. I mean, we are talking about a region where, I mean, we have discriminatory laws that are accepted by law. I mean, when you're talking about property, we know, we know by default that, you know, a woman will never be able to actually show you an asset guarantee because we are in a region where we have a discriminatory law that is basically based on a certain ideologies that don't allow women to have a property a kind of you know power over property so how flexible banks and financial institutions are on that level and then you have when we are talking about ecosystem we're talking about access to venture capital we're talking about huge event happening in the region and of course you always have that segment on women entrepreneurship in every event in the region, you have that big event on ecosystem. Uh, we don't want any more events about female uh, entrepreneurship. What we want is that you put your, you know, put money and support women, invest in women, financially speaking. Um, I think that's what women need. Um, we have done different workshops for investors to show how the gender biases are playing an important role when they decide to grant a certain finance to this or that entrepreneur. And in general, uh, investors, they would prefer to invest in a male, although the business pitch, I'm sorry for my language, is a bullshit, but because um, if you invest in women, there is more risk. There is a reaction on that from Algeria. They say that yes. does it, doesn't it depend from the sector, from the, from the business sector? Uh, the bias is really, I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm really with you, but the question is whether it's only on the, on the gender bias and it's, if it's not a sector bias. No, for it's, you. It's, it's, a, it's a gender biases in general because um, we have this tendency to kind of think that we have more female entrepreneurs working in social fields in the region, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and... Uh, which basically are very difficult to even finance and so on. But the gender biases are, are very general in the region. I mean, if you look at Lebanon, you have more women entrepreneurs working in tech. So this is the, the, the kind of, you know, futuristic ecosystem. However, you have more men uh, getting funded and, and having access to venture capital than women. I don't think it's a matter of sector. I think it's a gender biases um, by default because we as humans, we are product of our societies. We grew up with certain ideas, with certain perceptions that influence our decisions. And I think as long as we are not aware of those biases, as long as we don't examine those ideas that we grew up with, um, that would influence on the way we think, the way we view, the way we see, and the way we decide. So I think that is an important element to work on. Although it's a cliche, and people will be like, you know, what's important is just to have a good pitch and women, they have to pitch better than men. I think women, they have done enough. Um, I think it's not about women making more efforts. It's about institutions to put the right investment to create the right spaces for women in order to grow. And I think now with COVID context, 
I mean, if you look at the region, we have more than 50% of female population. Uh, we, have, we are losing more and more jobs and there are jobs there by women. So if we want to really progress in this region, if we want this region to grow, I think it's the moment for us to actually re-question re and re-examine the way we invest in women. Thank you very much, Sana. Very, very important. But uh, and uh, in the continuation of uh, of uh, Sukaina and Nadia, really, you you are very eye eye opener for for us and for the for me. For for so it's very good to have your to have your point of view. And I hope we stay in touch and can uh, and can uh, collaborate uh, to pursue the debate. I think Tara Chéri, would you would you intervene? I, I, can, I can reply in, in French as well. Just since I have a, another life and other responsibility in a continental and world-class uh, sports level, I see what is done. Of course, we are talking about uh, mindset and we need to give women the possibilities and the position that they deserve access to responsibility. But in certain institutions, if we do not... Um, create the conditions, uh, things do not move or require a lot of time to change. And I see, for instance, in the, in the sports world, the International European Committee, um, Olympic Committee, sorry, has, has, uh, has made uh, some, uh, has changed things, uh, not only for sportsmen and sportswomen, but also uh, at a level of responsibilities within the organization. So you are under obligation uh, in two years to have at least 50% of women in the teams and so on and so forth. And I think that this way of uh, doing things is uh, something really interesting. And that's how we can counterbalance, rebalance definitely uh, things. Because when you have important institution that say as an Olympic International Committee, I give you two years uh, to, uh, to be 50-50 in between men and women, that sends a strong signal. Um, and 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 generally, mainly the uh, men in these structures have responsibility and pressure. And the CEO has put some pressure and told them, "I give you two to three years to be fifty percent in your teams. Those who uh, will not comply in two to three years will not have the same opportunities as the others. And if we have the means and the opportunity and the will to do this everywhere across the board for instance in uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, boards of directors what what is uh, what is forbidden in having half and half men and women i uh, I, 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 I can assure you that this will bring uh, success to the company because uh, women generally manage really well companies. So in my opinion, we need to put pressure and to tackle international organization and pressure that can change the uh, paradigm on a global level. And we need to push them to do as the Olympic Committee did, uh, try to implement solution to be 50-50 uh, swiftly. Uh, we have o Omar Benia and, uh, and, and Madame Bourawi would like to say something. Omar? Yes. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody that uh, spoke. It was really interesting. But I just wanted to underline uh, the social and social and cultural aspect as i did in the chat room in uh, the southern countries i'm talking about algeria for instance i'm a professor at university and i have been working in the country i've created communication in work class uh, seminars and so on and so forth the 
state, if you allow me the expression, implemented everything they could to allow Algerian women to have access to all uh, positions. And the last example was uh, the selection to the popular uh, assembly when they asked for at least a 30% of women and hopefully, and that's why I'm talking about social and cultural aspect, religious even sometimes, or even most of the time, because hopefully, and I'm saying that again, hopefully, we managed to have 35% of women elected to the new uh, assembly. To summarize, the country has implemented system to access uh, loans and credits, credits which are equal if you are men and or woman i can give you some figures i i, I cannot give you sorry the, the figures right now for those who are interested there has been more than a one million jobs creating for women by women these are loans uh, up until 2017 i do not ha have the last figures because I do not have them, but I do not remember who spoke before, but anyway, they say that you need to ask authorization to your dad or your husband or your cousin. This is not the case in our country. And I'll go even further, a magistrate that is uh, that wants to marry needs a tutor this is paradoxical but still it's true so the social and cultural aspect is really important i think there is uh work to be done not in terms of uh rules and legislation is really a cultural work that we needed to do we need to free women in the sense uh where they need to become men if you'll allow me uh, because uh man and i'm talking about the masculine gender uh, we need to make a, a differentiation in between male and female because uh, a woman is not considered uh, as a human being sometimes, but as an inferior being, if you would. That's why they do not have access to all uh, positions. In, uh, in our community, for instance, we can... We can... A, a woman cannot go from Algiers or Abnaba in 50 kilometers because they, their parents, her parents do not want that they come back home alone. And she, she has to work where her brother, her husband or her, her family lives. And these are uh, paradoxically logical things, if you would, but uh, it exists anyway. But if you look at the text uh, of law, everything is done in the text to allow women to have access to studies, training, um, work. And in my university, most of the students are female. And in any case, the most successful students are female. But what happens when they finish their study? They cannot have access to, uh, to a job because of cultural reasons. Last intervention. Thank you very much, Mr. Benya. Um, when I'm listening to... Uh, Mr. Benya, of course, we are late on entrepreneurship, but we are even more late on the citizenship and the cultural questions. So uh, does the cult, does the financial sector moves quicker than uh, move quicker than the social one? It depends. It depends on the sector and it depends on the regions because uh, Algeria is one of the largest countries in uh, Africa. So you have mindset that can be completely different from one region to another. For instance, if you go in Kabylia on uh, Muzaibit in the south, um, the women 
cannot work. I've never seen a Musbit woman. Uh, they cannot get out of the house. But then if you go to LJ, you, LG, sorry, you see women entrepreneur. I know a woman here who has a small enterprise uh, for, um, for shell fruits and, and, and sea fruit. And, and I'm sorry, we are a bit late. I need to, to cut you to cut you off and uh, we will have to finish with the uh, um, madame borawi i'd like to thank my colleague because uh, it is really nice when she speaks from heart and i wanted to intervene on three points the first one is uh, the fact that we cannot continue if in uh, inheritance on uh, parental authority on the marriage uh, I, I don't know if it's cor politically correct or not, but uh, uh, we can say this is the illness, then you can leave, to pe leave people to die, but you cannot negate the illness. People must be equal, and this is a sickness in our society. Uh, I'm saying it's a, it's a cancer. Then you can accept to ha having a cancer or not. It depends on you. But the fact that a woman cannot have the same status than, an, than a man, we will have a problem. Secondly, of course, if we put quotas, this is a solution, at least for a start. It's exactly what we have to do, Mr. Tariq. Even 30%, 20% parliaments throughout the world, if we did not have quotas, would not have any women and would have been like that for centuries. So we need to push because otherwise we'll take three centuries to get there. And third, we are not wanting women to wear pants because uh, we could uh, as well say that we want men to wear skirts in that occasion. What, uh, it, 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 what we want is what Anima is doing today, but all the time uh, that they can speak and they uh, know that when they speak, they speak for other women as well to change the mindset of men. We are in this, uh, we we are here in this webinar, men and women, and I'd like for all the men here today, take into account everything that has been said here and try to change things. If any of you tries to change something, I, I say that Anima could uh, give some impulsion, could uh, uh, make some um, monitoring of the situation. But uh, womenpreneur and others are necessary to the, to the world, but we need men to consider this value question. Yes, sorry. My mic was off, says Emmanuel Notari. Thanks a lot for your really interesting speeches. We have to close the session because we are late and our interpreters need to leave us. All your speeches was were really interesting to us. In some cases, they were a bit shocking in, in a way, in a good way. They pushed us a lot. You can count on us. So we are going to do everything that is needed to play a role, to make a difference. This webinar opened our eyes, was really revealing to us on some aspects. And I would like to give the floor to a president to close the session. Thanks a lot to all of you. I'm really happy to having attended this uh, webinar. I've learned a lot. It's a long process, as uh, uh, Sukaina said, but I think that we need to be alert all the time. We need to be bold. There's a lot of work to be done, but if we really want to change the situation, we need to work for a long time it, because change will not come overnight. Quotas can be raised every year, 
until the situation has uh, been uh, improved for men and women everywhere. But we can't be indifferent. We need to play a role and we need to be bold to stretch lines and to make sure that the, the position of women is advanced so that she can have the position that she deserves. Thanks a lot for your attention. You can replay this webinar and in previous webinars in our, web, in our uh, website, in Good Practices, and also on our YouTube channel. Thanks a lot to all of you, and uh, we'll see you again in a month for the next webinar. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Au revoir.